Hello, this is the second lecture in my sequence of lectures on robust statistics. In this class, we're going to cover some lower bounds for robust statistics. And to do so, we will introduce some important statistical tools, including total variation distance and some statistical models of corruption. So let's get started. First, let's recap what we did in the first lecture. So in the first lecture, what we did was we gave two estimators for robust mean estimation. And we showed their correctness in two settings. So formally, we proved the following two theorems. First, we showed that if we were given an epsilon corrupted set of samples from a Gaussian with mean mu and variance sigma squared of sufficiently large size, so this set of samples has to have size at least omega of 1 over epsilon squared, then we showed that the median of the set of samples minus the true mean and absolute value is at most up to constant sigma times epsilon with high probability. I should say technically we only proved this for when sigma is equal to 1, but it's not too hard to see that everything scales in a natural way with sigma, for general sigma. So this is the Gaussian case. We also proved a similar uh, theorem in the case where our distribution is only assumed to have variance sigma squared and nothing else. So in that case, if we were given an epsilon corrupted set of samples from such a distribution of, again, sufficiently large size, so size at least omega of 1 over epsilon, then we showed that the truncated mean of this set of points differs from the true mean of the distribution up to constants by, again, at most sigma root epsilon with high probability. And again, technically, we only showed this for sigma is equal to 1, but again, things scale here in a natural way with sigma. So in this class, our goal will, to be, will be to show that these scalings with epsilon, particularly linear in this case, and root epsilon in this case, are optimal for both of these problems. So we will show matching lower bounds. And to do so, we will have to, as I mentioned in the title, introduce some important statistical notions. Uh, this will seem like a little bit of a digression at first, but I promise you it is very closely related to the problem of learning with outliers. So the first important statistical notion we will introduce is this notion of total variation distance, which as we will see is a, well first of all, classical notion of distance between probability distributions, and secondly is very closely related to learning with outliers. So what is it? So definition, let P and Q be two probability distributions over a shared probability space omega. Then the total variation distance between P and Q, which we will denote as d sub tv and pq, it is a supremum over all events in omega of the following two events. The probability if x is drawn from p that x lands within this event minus the probability of the same event if x is drawn from q. I will also denote this as uh, using a little bit of shorthand as simply p of a minus q of a where P of A is simply this and Q of A is simply that. Okay, good. I should say in the literature, this is also known as a bunch of other names because this is a very well-studied measure of distance. You also I see this referred to as statistical distance or L1 distance for reasons that should become clear in a second. So we will, in this lecture, relate this notion of distance to learning with outliers. To do so, we need to introduce one additional statistical notion, and that is coupling. So what is a coupling? It's a very powerful tool, actually, in probability theory. So let P1 and P2 be two probability distributions over two potentially different uh, probability sp spaces, omega1 and omega2, respectively. A coupling is a random variable over the product probability space, omega 1 times omega 2. So it is a random variable z, which can be denote, denoted, excuse me, x, y, where x is over omega 1 and y is over omega 2. And it is a coupling if the marginal of x, so if just this bit is distributed by itself as p1, and y, so the second bit, is distributed as p2. Of course, the important power of coupling is I don't I don't make any sort of restrictions on the relationship between x1 and uh, sorry x and y. In particular, they can be arbitrarily correlated as long as their marginals look like p1 and p2 respectively. Good. So that is what a coupling is. Now we can say the following important theorem, which is I should say a very uh, very classical fact in probability theory. So theorem, let P and Q be two probability distributions over RD 
And let's say they have probability density functions, little p and little q respectively. Then the following are equivalent ways of defining total variation distance. Uh, first of all, I can find it as I did before. So I can say the total variation distance is just a supremum over all events of the absolute value between p of a minus q of a. Secondly, I can just remove actually the absolute value. So I can just say it's a supremum without the absolute values of these two differences. Thirdly, I can say that it is 1 half times the L1 distance between the two PDFs. And finally, I can say, this is a little bit more complicated, that the total variation distance between P and Q is the infimum over all couplings x, y of P and Q of the probability that x is not equal to y. So this is a little bit abstract, but I promise that uh, this will be very important and will be very closely related to learning with outliers in a second. So let's prove this theorem first. So I claim that this theorem largely follows from the following important fact, which is, let me first define the two following uh, sets, S plus, which is a set of x such that P of x exceeds Q of x, and S minus is a set such that P of x is less than or equal to Q of x. So it's the complement of the set. Oh, and I should say, before I get too much into this proof, that uh, this statement actually holds much more generally. Um, I don't need PDFs. It does, this doesn't need to be over RD. You just need to use a little bit of measure theory. Um, but for simplicity, I'm going to not do that uh, in this class. OK, but back to the proof. I have these two sets, S plus and S minus. And then the claim is that the total variation distance between P and Q is actually just p of s plus minus q of s plus, or alternatively, q of s minus minus p of s minus. So in particular, this will already prove two, because this actually gives us two sets um, which attain all these supremums, and you can see that their values are all the same. OK, so let's prove this claim. And it will be very easy to see this, I hope. Uh, with a picture. So let's say P is this probability distribution. So this is P. And let's let Q uh, be this probability distribution. So this is P and Q. Then S plus is simply the following set where the PDF of Q is less than the PDF of p, so it's this in this case union of intervals, and then s minus is the remainder. So let's see what happens when we try to maximize p of a minus q of a over all sets a. So how do we maximize Q of a. And let me just rewrite this. This is simply, by definition, integral over a of p of x minus q of x dx. So if I get to choose my set a, then it's pretty obvious I don't want to choose any points from the set s minus. Because for all points in s minus, this difference p of x minus q of x is non-positive. On the other hand, I need to include all points in s plus, because for each point in s plus, uh, this contributes a positive value to my integral. So then it's pretty clear that the only thing I can do here is to maximize a, I need to take a to be s plus. Alternatively, if I want to maximize q of a minus p of a, well, that's just the same thing here, except the roles of p and q have been flipped. And now you can see that I can't include any point in s plus if I want to maximize this, because that will contribute a negative value to my integral. And I might as well include every point and s minus, uh, because that gives me a non-negative value in the integral. So here, I might as well take a to be s minus. And to see, finally, that these things are the same, simply notice that p of s plus minus q of s plus is equal to 1 minus p of s minus minus 1 minus q of s minus. And that is simply because um, p and q are probability distributions. And so this simplifies to q of s minus minus p of s minus. So this implies that the two things in my definition 
and 2 are indeed the same. And it's also not hard to see that this implies that they are both equal to the definition with the absolute values. So this implies that 1 is equal to, or 1 is equivalent to 2. Now let's show that 1 is equivalent to 3. Recall that this is the definition using the one half of the L1 norm between the two PDFs. And to do so, let's simply write out what one half of this L1 difference is. And let's simply uh, separate this into the integral over s plus and then the integral over s minus. So this is equal to 1 half times integral over s plus of the absolute value of p of x minus q of x plus integral over s minus of p of x minus q of x, absolute value. So what is this? Well, on the set s plus, p of x minus q of x is positive. So that implies that this integral is simply the same with and without the absolute value. On the other hand, on the set s minus, p of x minus q of x is always non-positive. So that means this is actually just equal to q of x minus p of x on the set s minus. And then this is simply p of s plus minus q of s plus. And this is q of s minus minus p of s minus. But we just argued uh, in our proof that 1 is equal to 2 that both of these are just total variation distance. So this is simply the total variation distance overall. OK, so that shows that the first three definitions are equivalent. And now let's consider the final definition. So this is the definition involving the couplings. So now let's show that 1 is equivalent to 4. And we'll, we will do this in two steps. First, we will demonstrate uh, that the DTV is at least the inf overall coupling. And to do so, it suffices to demonstrate a coupling that achieves this. OK, so how do we do this? Well, let me draw the picture I had above. Let's say this is P. Let's say this is Q. Let me define a function R of x, which is the pointwise minimum of P of x and Q of x. So this is simply this function here. OK. And then let me define two uh, functions. Let me call them f sub p of x is just p of x minus r of x. And f sub q of x is q of x minus r sub x. So note that by definition, all these functions are uh, pointwise non-negative. And let's compute their integrals. So first of all, integral of r of x dx. Well, I can split this integral again over these two sets, s plus and s minus. OK. And now on the set s plus, r of x being the minimum of p and q is simply q of x. And on the second set, uh, s minus, here p of x is less than q of x. So then r minus uh, on this, or sorry, r on the set s minus is simply p of x. So rewriting this slightly, this is simply q of s plus plus p of s minus. Again, using the fact that uh, q is a probability distribution, I can write this as 1 minus q of s minus plus p of s minus. And this is simply 1 minus the total variation distance of p and q by 2. Similarly, I can also compute the integral of fp. This is very easy, actually, because this is simply integral of p minus r, which is 1 minus integral of r, which is simply, by what we just computed, equal to the total variation distance between p and q. And similarly, integral of fq is the same thing.
So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to define some random variables because these facts imply that the random variable um, with the following distribution, which is r, which is 1 over minus dtv times r of x. So if I define this, uh, oops, excuse me. If I define a random variable with a PDF given by this, then this is well defined because this is a valid PDF. And similarly, I can define a random variable with PDF uh, given by so f sub p given by uh, f sub p times one over dtv. And I can also define f sub q to be distributed with, or I should say it has PDF uh, given by this 1 over dtv of f sub q. And now my coupling is straightforward. My coupling will do the following. Uh, so with probability 1 minus uh, dtv of p and q, sample x is equal to y uh, is distributed as r. Otherwise, so now with probability uh, dtv of p and q, sample x according to fp and y according to fq. Okay, so this is clearly a valid coupling, or sorry, this is a way of defining a tuple x comma y. Now we just need to show that this is a valid coupling. So why is this a valid coupling? Well, to, do, to check that it's a valid coupling, we just need to compute the marginals of this coupling. So let's compute the marginal of x. Well, the marginal of x is with probability 1 minus dtv of pq. Uh, it is equal to r, which is conveniently 1 over dtv of p q. And then with probability dtv of pq, it is simply 1 over dtv pq of f sub p. But these things all nicely cancel out. So this is equal to r of x minus f sub p of x which if you, or sorry, plus f sub p of x, which if you scroll to the definition of f sub p, it is distributed, the PDF of this is simply p of x. And similarly, uh, if I do the same thing for y, the marginal of y will also come out to q. So this is a valid uh, coupling, and by definition of this coupling, with probability 1 minus dtv of p and q, uh, they are equal. So that means the only time they cannot be equal is when this happens. So this implies that dtv is at least the nth overall uh, x, y of the probability that x is not equal to y. So that's the first direction, and now we need to show the second direction, or the other direction. So now let's show that dtv is at most the nth that x is not equal to y. Hello, Jerry from the future here. While I was editing the video, I realized that I messed up this proof, even though it's very simple. Uh, so let's do it properly. So let me define four events. Excuse me. E sub AB, uh, which is the event that X is in SA and Y is in SB. Here, I'm taking AB to be plus minus valued. Uh, and here, as always, I'll be taking uh, x, y to be a valid coupling of p and q. Okay, I want to make a couple of quick observations about these sets. The first observation is that because the marginal of the x-coordinate of uh, z is distributed as p, we know that p of s plus, which is the probability that x lies within s plus, this is simply the probability of e plus 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 the probability of e plus minus, simply because uh, either y will be an s plus or an s minus, because uh, s plus and s minus form a partition of Rd. Similarly, we know that q of s plus is the probability of e plus 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 the probability of e minus plus, because again, we're just marginalizing out x. 
Okay, second observation is that if uh, xy lands within e plus minus, or also e minus plus, uh, then certainly x is not equal to y because uh, s plus and s minus are disjoint sets. So that implies that the probability that of the event e plus minus is less than the probability that x is not equal to y. Okay, so let's just put these things together. So recall we know that the dtv between p and q by this claim, this is p of s plus minus q of s plus. We can rewrite this as simply probability of e plus 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 probability of e mi uh, plus minus minus probability of e plus plus uh, plus probability of e minus plus. So this simplifies slightly to be probability of e plus minus minus probability of e minus plus. So probabilities are non-negative, so I can always throw out this term. I can say this is less than probability of e plus minus, which by our second observation is at most the probability that x is not equal to y. OK, now back to past year. So why did that matter? So let's go back to this world of robust statistics. And let's recall a little bit. So recall this is the definition of epsilon corruption. So it's epsilon corrupted if we can uh, write it as the following. Uh, as s is equal to s sub good union s sub bad set minus s sub removed, where s sub good is a set of n independent samples from D. And s sub bar is a set of points I remove from s sub good. And s sub bar and s sub bad both have size exactly epsilon times n. So the whole point of this exercise is the following corollary. Let P and Q be such that the total variation distance between P and Q is epsilon. Then if X1 and Xn are just N independent draws from P, then with high probability, some uh, one minus exponential of minus omega of C squared N, then these are XE A1 plus epsilon C corrupted set of samples from Q. Okay, and let's see why. And to do this, we're going to use the fact, th this coupling fact. So we're going to use this one implies four. It's only a four characterization. So recall, uh, this says that if DTV, P and Q, is equal to epsilon, this implies there exists a coupling, uh, Z is equal to X comma Y, such that uh, the probability that x is not equal to y is less than or equal to the total variation distance p and q. In fact, equal to the total variation distance p and q. OK, so how do I use this? So suppose I'm given uh, n independent draws from q. So let's say I have y1 through yn drawn independently from q. My objective will be to try to change them to look like n i d draws from p. Well, I can imagine actually having drawn the y's through this slightly complicated process, which is first I draw z1 through zn as n independent copies of this coupling random variable, and then I just throw away the x parts. So formally, I can sample x1 comma y1 up through xn comma yn independently uh, from the z distribution, and then just throw away the x1 through xn. So then I claim that the following strategy will work which is simply replace the uh, y's with the x's. Okay, and let's see why this works. Well, first of all, um, the x's are certainly going to be n i d draws from uh, p, just by the definition of coupling. But the, the worry is that I might need to change too many of the y's, right? Because I'm only allowed a budget of 1 plus c epsilon n changes by my definition of corruption. So let's just count how many things I need to change. So let me let u sub i be the indicator, which is 1 if x sub i is not equal to yi, so I need to change it, 0 otherwise. Well, u sub i's are independent Bernoulli's. They're independent because the z's are independent. And the expectation of u sub i is just simply the total variation distance by the definition of the coupling. 
And now we just simply need to bound the probability that the sum of the user buys exceeds 1 plus c times epsilon n. Because that will say I need to change at least 1 plus c times epsilon n things. But this is exactly the bound in which, there's, sorry, this is exactly the regime in which we can use turnoff bounds. And this exactly gives us this formula, so omega of c squared n. And that, that completes the proof. That says that with high probability, I won't have to change more than 1 plus c times epsilon n points to achieve the strategy. And this is really the power of the coupling. This coupling says that really, almost all the time, I can make these samples look the same. So of course, I don't have to change very many. In particular, this implies immediately the following corollary. Suppose I have two distributions, p and q, with total variation distance epsilon. Uh, and let c be greater than 0. Then I claim that there's no way to do the following task uh, with good advantage. I want to distinguish, uh, given a set of samples, between the following two cases. Either s is supposed to be a 1 plus c times epsilon corrupted set of samples from p, or it's just n independent draws from q. Then by what we just showed, uh, it's impossible to succeed at this task with probability which is much better than a half plus epsilon, sorry, uh, x but minus omega c squared n. Just because we know that with uh, probability 1 minus x of minus omega c squared n, we can make case 1 and case 2 literally be the same. And this will be very useful for proving lower bounds. So this in particular will be our lower bound strategy for both of the lower bounds we proved today. What we're going to do is we're going to suppose I want to prove a lower bound for uh, estimating the mean of a Gaussian in the presence of noise. I will exhibit two Gaussians, uh, let's call them P and Q where their means are quite far. Let's say their means are, it turns out their means will have uh, distance omega of epsilon. Okay, and I will show that their total variation distance of the two distributions is epsilon. Now suppose I had a mean estimation algorithm that could do much better than order epsilon error. Then in particular, uh, I could run my algorithm given samples uh, produced from this task and then I would be able to distinguish between case one and case two with good, with good confidence. But this is impossible. So this says that if I can exhibit two Gaussians with total variation distance epsilon and their means differing by most, or sorry, by at least epsilon, uh, then I can't ever have a mean estimation algorithm that does better than order epsilon error in the presence of noise. Okay, hopefully that makes sense, but we'll walk through that a little bit later as well. Let me just say, actually, that this, uh, this notion of corruption is, is already quite, it's, it's quite powerful already. It's essentially another way, or a slightly weaker way, of generating outliers. Um, so we recall the full corruption model is uh, my adversary gets my set of points, and then they know everything, right? They know P, or the underlying distribution. They know the task, and they know my algorithm, and then they're allowed to just change an epsilon fraction of these points. Well, this process where I take my distribution Q and change it to a distribution Q um, is almost the same. The only difference is that I don't actually know the samples themselves. I will know P, I know my task, and I know the algorithm, but the adversary just doesn't know the actual samples. So in that sense, it's slightly weaker. It's oblivious to the actual you know, the samples themselves. However, it's already a, quite a natural notion of corruption. And then as a result, we will actually uh, define it. So we'll give it a name. We say that S is epsilon obliviously corrupted from P if it is n independent draws from a distribution Q with total variation distance at most epsilon to P. And as I just argued, up to these like small 1 plus C factors, which are subconstant, um, this is a like strictly weaker uh, corruption model than the full corruption model that we considered last lecture and that we will consider uh, mainly throughout this class. I should say, and this is again a little bit of a tangent, that there's also other notions of corruption that we will consider, or that are worth mentioning, I should say. Um, in particular, there's one notion of corruption which is again weaker than the full corruption model, in which uh, the adversary, they do get to see the points, but they only are allowed to add points. So we call the full corruption model is allowed to see the set of points, knows everything, and then uh, remove an epsilon fraction of points, and then add an epsilon fraction of points. Instead, we say that a set of points S is epsilon additively corrupted if it is written as S is equal to S uh, sub good, union S sub bad, 
where s of good is a set of epsilon, uh, sorry, one minus epsilon n independent draws from d, and the size of s of bad is equal to epsilon n. That is, uh, I just took some points and I added some outliers. I wasn't allowed to change the points themselves, but I was able to, I was allowed to maybe look at them, inspect them, uh, but all I could do was add an epsilon fraction of points. Okay, and just like how there is a statistical analog of full corruption, this oblivious corruption, there's also an oblivious, sorry, a statistical analog of additive corruption. Uh, and this is actually the first notion of corruption that was ever considered um, in the robust statistics literature. And it is known, it was introduced in this paper by Peter Huber back in 1964 and is therefore known as Huber's contamination model. And I won't actually like prove the equivalence between uh, these two models of corruption, but the, the proof is almost exactly the same. Uh, but we say that S is a set of epsilon obliviously additively corrupted points. That's a bit of a mouthful. From D, if S is a set of n independent draws from some distribution, which is a mixture of D uh, and some other distribution n with mixing weights 1 minus, 1 minus epsilon and epsilon. So this just means that with probability 1 minus epsilon, I get a sample from D. And with probability epsilon, I get a sample from n. So it shouldn't be too hard to see why this should be sort of an analog to additive corruption. Yeah, I mentioned these things mostly for historical reasons. Throughout this uh, class, we will almost exclusively work with the, the, the full corruption model, at least for the upper bounds. There, is a, there are, of course, uh, relationships between these models. So the full corruption model is the strongest. So this is strongest. So this is stronger than everything. So this is stronger than the oblivious corruption. It is also stronger, and it's not too hard to see why. It's stronger than the epsilon additive corruption. And this, in turn, is, of course, stronger than the epsilon oblivious additive corruption, the Huber contamination model. Okay. Now, there is no direct comparison between oblivious corruption and additive corruption, between this and this. Uh, there are schemes that you can do with one that you can't do with the other for both directions. However, there is a not too hard to see uh, relationship between these two in that oblivious corruption is stronger than oblivious additive corruption. And that is simply because when my samples come from this form, this distribution always has total variation distance at most epsilon to D. Okay, but that was a little bit of a tangent. Um, essentially, while you know all these squares, all, sorry, all these uh, different models of corruption are, you know, have different powers. Qualitatively, essentially, all the results hold for all of them, as far as I know, up to maybe like logarithmic factors in some special cases. So I don't think we lose very much just by studying the strongest model of corruption. Okay, so that was a bit of a digression. Uh, let's now return to the task that I promised that we would do at the beginning of this lecture, which is to actually prove lower bounds for robust mean estimation for Gaussians and for distributions with bounded second moment. So let's first do, uh, let's prove a lower bound for the Gaussian setting. We will prove the following theorem. Suppose epsilon is sufficiently small and let sigma be greater than zero. And let mu sub one and mu sub two be two numbers such that their difference is sigma times epsilon. Then we will show that the total variation distance between these two Gaussians uh, with mean mu one and mu two respectively and variance sigma squared is theta of epsilon. And again, this suffices. And let's just recap this again. This is because if, suppose I call this distribution D1 and this distribution D2, because their total variation distance is epsilon, that means I can get from one to the other by changing an epsilon fraction of points, or one plus you know, a little bit more than epsilon fraction of points uh, with high probability. Which means that suppose I had a uh, robust mean estimation algorithm that could learn uh, my error or sorry, my mean, to error which is much better than sigma times epsilon. Say it's much better than sigma epsilon over two. Then that means, given epsilon corrupted samples, I could run that algorithm, and I could distinguish between D1 and D2. But we know that we cannot, because with high probability, we can literally make the samples look the same by corrupting a small fraction of them. So this theorem, along with our, cor uh, with our machinery, has the corollary that no algorithm can ever do better than sigma epsilon error. So now let's just prove this theorem, and I claim that this theorem follows just from direct calculation. So the way that we will compute this total variation distance is just through direct calculation of the L1 of the PDS. 
So first, without without much loss of generality, let's just assume that sigma is equal to one. And that's just because everything is invariant to scaling again. So you can just check that all these calculations will work just the same for general sigma. So let's assume sigma is equal to one, and let's also assume without loss of generality that mu sub one is less than mu sub two. Okay, so the picture is as follows. So I have one Gaussian with mean mu sub 1. And then I have another Gaussian with mean mu sub 2. And our assumption is that this distance is epsilon. OK, and I want to calculate the total variation distance between these two distributions. Well, I can just write down the total variation distance. It's the using the, the third of the four equivalences that we proved, uh, the total variation distance is just one half, make some room, it's one half of the L1 distance between the two PDFs. Uh, and what is what are, what are the two PDFs? Well, it's up to this shared scaling factor of one over root two pi, simply e to the minus x minus, sorry, just realized this should be mu sub one, this is e uh, to the minus x minus mu sub 1 squared over 2 minus e to the minus x minus mu 2 squared over 2 dx. OK. We can simplify this a bit. So upon just the uh, direct uh, inspection, if I call this point, which is the midpoint between these two, so this is, the, this is mu sub 1 plus mu sub 2 over 2, uh, you will see that this PDF, the PDF of D1, is larger than the PDF of D2, if and only if I'm to the left of this point. And moreover, uh, this integral here, which is the difference of the PDFs on that side, is exactly the same as this integral, which is the difference of the integral uh, of the PDFs to the right. So that means if I just compute the value uh, of this bit here, the left part, and I multiply by two, I will get the the, the overall L1 distance. So what, what that's saying is that this total variation distance is actually uh, simply one over root two pi integral from minus infinity to this point in the center, which I will call, let me just call this A, A of E to the minus x minus mu sub 1 squared over 2 minus e to the minus x minus mu sub 2 squared over 2 dx. OK, and we can even get away with doing even less work, because observe what uh, this part of it, of the integral is. Well, the formula says it is the value of the integral up to this point, it's just simply that mass. But if I think about it, I can also just do the following, which is, so this distance we know is epsilon over 2, and this distance is epsilon over 2. So I claim that this mass here is simply the same as if, if I join, just drawn this point, which is has distance epsilon over 2. So this is just mu1 minus epsilon over 2, and taken the mass of the integral of this tail. Okay, so again, what I'm claiming is that the integral of this red portion is also the integral of this red portion. And this should just be because of translational invariance of Gaussians. Which means this is actually just because you know this part will cancel most of the integral of this part. This is simply integral, sorry, 1 over root 2 pi, integral from mu 1 minus epsilon over 2 to mu 1 plus epsilon over 2 of e to the minus x uh, minus mu sub 1 squared over 2 dx. OK, so it is simply, if this is mu sub 1, I draw this interval of radius, or yeah, radius epsilon over 2, and I evaluate the mass of this integral here. OK, but this is just simply the same as if I just pretended this was 0. This is negative epsilon over 2, and this is epsilon over 2. And I won't actually finish this calculation, but 
you should just believe me because um you know by the same smoothness of gaussians right this this is an interval of length epsilon over two everything here will be quite smooth so that this, this this integral is essentially linear in the size of this interval so this will just be root 2 pi times some constant which i won't compute times theta of epsilon so the overall thing is also theta of epsilon okay and you can work it out work it out more carefully but at a high level this is all correct so this proves the theorem and by our machinery this also this theorem implies a lower bound of order of epsilon for Gaussian mean estimation in the presence of noise. Okay, now let's conclude uh, by proving the final lower bound, which is for robustly learning the mean under uh, second moment assumptions. And again, here all I have to do is prove the following theorem, which is to show that there exist two distributions, d1 and d2, such that both d1 and d2 have variance at most sigma squared. d2 can be written as a 1 minus epsilon. Uh, mixture of d1 with epsilon noise. And moreover, if I let mu1 and mu2 be the means of d1 and d2 respectively, then the difference between the means is root epsilon times sigma. And again, by the same machinery as before, this immediately implies that no learner can ever hope to, given epsilon corrupted samples from d1 or d2, do better than distinguishing them, or can ever, they, sorry, no, no algorithm can ever distinguish them. Um, in particular, this means that there can't be any learner which can learn the mean to much better than this error. Okay, so let's prove this. This is even easier. My distributions will be completely trivial. My distribution D1 is the point mass at zero. And my distribution D2 will be 1 minus epsilon times D1 plus epsilon times the point mass at 1 over root epsilon. So pictorially, uh, d1 is the delta distribution. This is d1. And d2 is the mixture of this with, uh, this is 1 over root epsilon, with this delta, the delta at 1 over root epsilon. So all we have to do is verify that the, these have the quanti or these properties that we want. So let's just check. So clearly d1 has variance 0, so it's variance less than sigma squared. And d2 clearly has this form, because just, I mean, by definition. So we also have to check that d2 has variance at most sigma squared, or I guess I should have said, my apologies. Again, I'm going to assume that sigma is equal to 1, and that everything is going to hold um, by scale invariance uh, for the more general case. OK, so now I need to check that d2 has variance 1. But the variance of d2 is upper bounded by the second moment of d2. And the second moment of d2 is expectation x drawn from d2 of x squared. But with probability 1 minus epsilon, x squared is 0. And with probability epsilon, it is 1 over root epsilon squared. So its variance is exactly 1. OK, good. Or sorry, the second moment is exactly 1, so in particular its variance is at most 1. Finally, let's check the third property. Clearly the mean of d1 is 0, and the mean of d2 well, with probability 1 minus epsilon, it is again 0, and with probability epsilon is 1 over root epsilon, so its mean is root epsilon. And that concludes the proof, so that proof is quite straightforward. OK, let me wrap up this lecture with a couple of notes. So first of all, observe that this uh, lower bound for bounded second moments actually holds in the very weakest model of corruption, this epsilon obliviously additive corruption model. Because d2, in addition to only having total variation distance epsilon, has this very specific form of a mixture of d1 with noise. So this completely op uh, closes the problem uh, of mean estimation under bounded second moments, because we know that the truncated mean uh, works in the full corruption model, and the lower bound holds even in the weakest model. Now, technically, I haven't done the same for the Gaussian, right? Because I haven't shown a lower bound in the weakest model of oblivious additive corruption. But with a little bit of extra work, you can do so. Uh, and that pretty much, and you'll get the same result. And that's pretty much all I really want to say about one dimensions. Uh, you can see sort of there's the, the, the problems here are 
Well, here we just completely solved them and it wasn't so hard. In the next lecture, we're going to shift our attention to the high dimensional setting. And this is where things get a lot more tricky. And as we'll see, there gets uh, we get to introduce this sort of new component to the question of runtime. Because you know the truncated mean and the median, which were the estimators that achieved the, the matching upper bounds, are very they're all very easy to compute. But as we'll see, it's not so obvious how to get good upper bounds in high dimensions without doing something much more computationally intensive. So that's all I have for this time, uh, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.